Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Colin Call. Uh, I'm the social science co-director for the Center for International Security and Cooperation here at Stanford. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the Drell Lecture. This lecture series is named after Sid Drell, who you can see on the screen there, a theoretical physicist, arms control specialist, and a founding co-director of CSAC. The series was established in 1994 by Bud and Cicely Whelan to honor Sid, who Bud had worked closely with on satellite reconnaissance when Bud Whelan was deputy director of the CIA for science and technology. Since its founding in the early 1980s, CSAC has always focused on the intersection between science, technology, policy, and international security, bringing together scientists and social scientists to analyze some of the greatest challenges facing humanity. Initially, CSAC stood for the Center for International Security and Arms Control, and the center's work initially focused primarily on issues of nuclear security, arms control, and disarmament. Over the years, the center's, the center's name changed to the Center for International Security and Cooperation, although we were lucky enough to be able to keep our acronym, CSAC, and the research focus has broadened to include not just nuclear security, but biosecurity, environmental security, and of course, digital security. For years, CSAC has been at the cutting edge of policy research on cybersecurity here at Stanford, and now our focus on digital security has expanded to include the implications of artificial intelligence and machine learning on international security. It is in this context that we are thrilled to have Paul Charre join us here at Stanford to deliver a Drell lecture on autonomous weapons and the future of war. Paul, who I'll welcome out here in a minute, is a good friend of mine and a senior fellow and Director of Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security, a nonpartisan Washington, D.C.-based think tank. He is the author of Army of None, which came out last year, the subtitle of which is Autonomous Weapons in the Future of War, which Bill Gates uh, called one of the top five books of 2018. Paul formerly worked at the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon, where he played a leading role in establishing policies on emerging weapons technologies, including leading the working group that drafted DOD Directive 3000.09, establishing the Pentagon's policy on autonomy and weapon systems. He is also a former infantryman in the Army's 75th Ranger Regiment and served multiple tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Paul will speak to us for the next 30 to 40 minutes, and then he'll engage in a conversation with Dr. Radha Iyengar Plum from Facebook and Professor Jeremy Weinstein from the Political Science Department here at Stanford, followed by your questions. And hopefully you had a chance to pick up an index card uh, uh, on your way in. If you did and you have a question, I recommend that you write it down during the, uh, sometime during the lecture, and they'll be collected afterwards and sorted uh, by Jeremy and Radha. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Paul Charre to the stage. Thanks, Colin, um, for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. I'm Paul Shari from the Center for New American Security. I want to talk to you today about how technology is evolving in warfare, and in particular, this very difficult challenge of what artificial intelligence and autonomy may mean in war. Now, we are already well into the military robotics revolution, which has been unfolding for the past two decades as we see countries around the globe building military robots of various shapes and sizes. This is a map of armed drone proliferation around the globe. This is a, a map that's in the book. It's actually a little bit out of date already um, as more countries around the globe get a hold of armed military robots. At least 90 countries have drones of some kind today, including many non-state groups, and well over a dozen have armed drones, and you can see where they're coming from. Over 90% of international armed drone transfers come from China. So the US does not have a monopoly on this technology. We don't have to get to control how it develops or how it spreads. And there are really difficult questions that we're going to face about how humanity deals with this very powerful technology. As we see this moving forward, it's not just the spread of existing drones, but their evolution in the future that is particularly concerning. This is the X-45 drone, now in a museum, but it was one of the first prototypes for a stealth combat drone that would be used in future high-end contested environments where advanced militaries fight against each other. 
And with each generation, we are seeing not only uh, advantages like stealth features, which you can see this is designed to start to incorporate radar-defeating stealth technology based on its shape, but also things like more advanced autonomy as a feature of all of these drones. And just like we see in automobiles, an evolution of more advanced autonomy with each generation, the same is true with robotic weaponry. Raising the question for military robots, as we get further down the line, how comfortable are we with delegating some of these decisions to machines? What happens when a Predator drone has as much autonomy as a self-driving car? And how do we feel about machines making life and death decisions in war? That's the topic of this book, and I want to walk you through some examples of things that countries are building around the globe today. This is a totally uninhabited boat. It drives autonomously. You can see there's nobody on board there. Uh, this was being used in a demonstration by the US Navy on the James River in Virginia a few years ago now, about five years ago. And in this particular demonstration, it was not one, but actually five boats used as a swarm working cooperatively together. Now, this was used by the Navy because um, the Navy faces threats from its ships, threats from other countries, terrorist groups who might try to get close and attack US Navy ships. In this particular demonstration they were doing, they had a US Navy vessel moving along a mock strait transit, so as if it were, for example, transiting the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, and they had five of these boats that were used to intercept a suspicious vessel approaching. It wasn't actually a suspicious vessel, right? It was a, you know, the US ship, but they said, okay, we're gonna pretend there's a suspicious thing approaching and tasked out five of these boats to go out, intercept all autonomously and then work together to encircle this other vessel. Now, this demonstration was quite public. It was pretty clear that the Navy was trying to actually do some messaging to potential adversaries. They didn't say Iran, but I'll say it, probably Iran, um, who routinely harasses US Navy ships in the Straits of Hormuz. And one of these boats, not this one, but another one, had a machine gun on it, 50 caliber machine gun. So as they're doing this, and they're briefing all this to reporters, one of the reporters said, what's up with the gun? You're telling me all about this autonomy and swarming. Um, who's controlling the gun? And the Navy's answer, I kid you not, was, we haven't decided yet. <laughs> Which um, you know, was a very exciting headline for the reporter, but, but actually speaks to some of the challenges that militaries are facing in this space. Which is to say the technology is moving forward, and they sometimes haven't yet decided what those rules are going to be for what they're going to use autonomy in the future. Now, it's not just the United States building these technologies. They're being built all around the globe. This is an Israeli system called the Guardian, a ground vehicle. Again, um, drives autonomously, no one on board. It has reportedly been used along the Gaza border. And another version of this, not in this photograph, but another one, uh, is also reportedly armed. Now, Israel has said that while the vehicle may drive on its own, humans will always be in control of the weapons used on board. But not all countries might see it that same way. This is the Russian Urin 9 ground robotic vehicle. It's a much larger vehicle. Um, if it carried people, we might say it's an armored personnel carrier, carries a heavy caliber machine gun and anti-tank rockets. These rockets actually are in little extendable um, arms that stretch out to allow it to hide behind a hillside or a berm to ambush tanks, presumably NATO tanks. And Russia actually deployed this to Syria last year. They had it operating in combat operations in Syria for a few weeks. They pulled it back. Um, reportedly, according to press reports, it didn't do very well. There were uh, problems with its communications in the urban environments within Syria. That suggests that it's not very autonomous, at least today but Russia is experimenting with this technology. And Russian military leaders have said that their intention is to build fully roboticized units in the future that are capable of independent operations. So when we look at the way the countries are talking about this technology, certainly the way that Russian or Chinese leaders talk about this is not the same as some of the um, more hesitant comments or comments about keeping humans involved 
that we hear from Western countries. This is the X-47B, now also in a museum, but at the time, a prototype demonstration aircraft being built by the US Navy. You can see it here landing on an aircraft carrier. It was the first aircraft to, first unmanned aircraft, uh, uninhabited aircraft, with no one on board, to autonomously take off and land from an aircraft carrier and to do um, autonomous aerial refueling. So at the time, really groundbreaking aircraft. Now, as you can see based on its shape, this also is intended to be a bridge towards a stealth combat aircraft in the future. The Navy has currently changed their plans, but there are a number of countries around the globe building aircraft like this, not just the US, but also the UK, France, uh, Russia, and China, and Israel, all building prototypes to be combat aircraft that could operate inside very contested environments. Now this matters because a lot of the drones today are not very sophisticated. Um, they could easily be shot down or have their communications jammed. These aircraft are supposed to operate inside very heavily defended areas, inside the enemy's airspace. In that same environment, where enemies will have advanced air defense systems, they also will likely be able to jam these aircraft's communication links, which poses very difficult questions about what you want it to do when it's out on its own. This, this question, this simple question of when this thing's on its own and someone has jammed its communications, what should it do? That motivated the department's policies back in 2012 to write an internal policy guidance that shaped DOD um, design of these systems going forward. At the time, I was working in the Pentagon, and I posed that question to my boss. I said, well, what do you think, boss? What should happen? He said, well, I, you know, I think it should do this. I said, that's great. That means nothing. Because who are you? He said, well, I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. I said, that's great. That's not written down anywhere, though, is it? And so that led to that then policy directive. But there are a variety of possible solutions. One could say it's going to um, come home if it loses communication links. You could also say, well, it's going to be allowed to take pictures, do surveillance, but not drop any weapons. It's another option. Countries could decide to say, well, we'll allow it to strike pre-planned fixed targets. It's kind of how a cruise missile functions today. And that would be OK. Countries could also say, um, well, you know, there are many targets that militaries care about that are mobile, that are relocatable, that move. Militaries have learned to make their uh, very high value assets move around so they can't be targeted from the air. And so if it finds these, what the military calls targets of opportunity, we're going to let it to attack. Now that might sound very risky. It certainly adds another element of risk. But there are some targets where you really might care about that. Things like nuclear tip mobile missile launchers that North Korea has, where having an aircraft like this operate inside North Korean airspace in the event of a war and strike those targets before they could be launched could save millions of lives. Or what about questions about allowing it to defend itself? If someone shot at this, could it be allowed to shoot back? These are all very real practical questions militaries will have to face as they put systems like this out in the field in the coming years. And there are no clear out answers. And in many cases, countries have not yet decided for themselves what the answers will be. Now, it's not just in the air as well. Um, we're building uh, ships. Uh, ground vehicles, in this case, a very large, sizable ship. This is the US Navy ship called the Sea Hunter. Um, and to be clear, there are many countries building things like this. Um, but for copyright reasons, it's a lot easier for me to show you pictures of US ones, um, which are public domain. So uh, in this case, this is a totally robotic vessel. There are obviously people on it in this photograph. You can see them. Um, but this sailed from San Diego to Hawaii totally autonomously earlier this year and is part of the US Navy's fleet. Now this one is designed to track enemy submarines. So no weapons at all on board. You'd think that would make this a lot easier, but now you have to worry about things like, what if someone undertakes a hostile boarding of this? A couple of years ago, there was an incident where the Chinese Navy went and just seized control of a US Navy robotic um, vessel underwater. A small underwater robot was doing reconnaissance in the South China Sea, and a Chinese ship came up and seized control of it. So 
in that case, China gave it back um, after the US protested. But for something like this, there's very sensitive equipment on board. You might not want an adversary to get their hands on this. So would this be allowed to defend itself? Would you be comfortable with that kind of thing, with either lethal or non-lethal weapons? It's not just in uh, vehicles. We're also seeing more advanced autonomy in missiles. This is a screenshot from a video of an advanced missile called the Long Range Anti-Ship Missile, or LRASM. One of the things that it can do that's a um, little bit new, a little bit different, is while humans still choose the target, in this case it's a ship and they're going after an enemy ship, it's allowed to change its route on the way to the target. So if there is a pop-up threat um, indicated here in red, then the missile can navigate on its own. It's one example of some of this very incremental autonomy that we're seeing develop with each generation of these systems. Now I want to talk a little bit about some things that have been in existence for a while, because autonomy is not a new phenomenon in military systems. This is the high-speed anti-radiation missile. Um, it is a homing missile that goes after enemy radars. It's been around for decades. And missiles like this are widely used by countries around the globe. In fact, homing munitions date back to World War II, to the very first acoustic homing torpedoes that could zero in on the sound of a ship's propellers. Now, weapons of this type have a sensor on board. They can detect an enemy target, and they can maneuver to hit that target. That's very useful because lots of targets in uh, warfare move. Imagine if you're in a submarine trying to hit a ship, that ship's going to move. And so these types of missiles or torpedoes um, are used widely by militaries around the globe. Many of them are what you might call fire and forget weapons. So once released, it's not coming back. It can make some very simple decisions on its own. But by and large, when the way these are used, humans are still choosing the target. So a human is deciding, this is a valid enemy target, and I'm going to launch this munition to attack it. So I'll distinguish here in this diagram between what I'm going to call semi-autonomous weapons, here in the blue, where a human chooses the target. A human says, I have some indication that there is a valid enemy target at this point in time and space, versus what I'll call a fully autonomous weapon in the red, that a human might launch a weapon to go over a wide area, search for enemy targets, and then the weapon itself can make the decision about which ones to attack. The ones in the blue, widely used today. Things in the red, eh, it's a little bit fuzzier. So I'll give you some of the gray area here. There are at least 30 countries today that have um, in use human supervised autonomous weapons. So weapons that can survey the environment, they can identify potential targets, and then attack them all on their own, but humans supervise their operation, they could turn them off if they're not happy with them. This is the US Army's CRAM, Counter Rocket Artillery and Mortar System. Um, it's a gun that was originally designed for US Navy ships then placed on land. Other examples include the Army's Patriot Air Defense System and the Navy's Aegis Combat System. Again, at least 30 countries use things like this today, and they're used for situations where the speed of incoming threats might overwhelm humans' ability to respond. So if you're in a certain generation, you might remember an old Atari game called Missile Command. And gather how, how good you are, there's some level where uh, the incoming threats might overwhelm your ability to respond and you, you lose the game. It's the same thing in real world, just with much higher stakes. And these are used for situations where someone might have to turn into fully automatic to shoot down incoming threats to defend a ship, or a land base, or a ground vehicle. Now, in an offensive capacity, there are some isolated examples of weapons like this being used. This is the Israeli Harpy drone. It's a loading munition, goes over a wide area, hunts for radars. When it finds one, attacks it all by itself. It's a kamikaze weapon. You actually don't want this really coming back at you. It's got a, um, a seeker in the front and then a warhead. And when it finds an enemy radar, it'll dive bomb into it and attack it. It's been sold to uh, India, Turkey, China, South Korea. And perhaps not surprisingly, China has reportedly reverse engineered their own version of this. That's not particularly new invention. Um, loading munitions date back to the 1980s. 
This is a, um, it's a little bit fuzzy here, because um, this is an actual um, photograph of a pamphlet from the US Navy from the 1980s of a missile called the Tomahawk anti-ship missile, which was designed to go over the horizon and hunt for Soviet ships. So it'd be launched from a uh, ship or a sub, oop, I goofed that up, hold on. From a ship or a submarine, fly out over the horizon, and then search for ships. So the way this might work is that um, a maritime patrol aircraft would identify that there's a Soviet ship in an area. By the time the missile gets there, the ship will have moved. So the missile can fly its own search pattern. Now this was in the US inventory for about a decade and then taken out of inventory in the 90s. And talking to US Navy officers from the time, one of the things they said is that there was a lot of discomfort with this weapon. That people were concerned about two big things. One was when it gets out there and it turns on its seeker and it starts looking, what's it gonna find? The technology from the 80s, not very precise, it could distinguish between a ship and ocean water, but it couldn't accurately discriminate between a Soviet warship and, say, a merchant vessel. And so that was one concern. The other one was, and this is a little bit more practical, if you don't really know where the enemy ship is, why are you launching the missile in the first place? If there's some degree of uncertainty. And there was a concern that you might waste this weapon. For militaries, these are not only expensive, they're also very scarce. A ship only carries so many on board. And so if you launch it and it misses its target, you've wasted a very scarce and valuable asset in wartime. And so we have not seen this technology widely proliferate around the globe, even though some of it dates back in a crude form several decades. What's possible, though, is that drones begin to change this equation. Because for drones, you could send it out on patrol, and if it didn't find the target, would come back. And you could send it again the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And so we may begin to see more freedom being used with autonomous systems now that more countries have recoverable drones. There are also people pushing the boundaries of this technology in things like swarming applications. This is a demonstration of um, swarming aircraft being done by the Naval Postgraduate School uh, down in Monterey, California. And they uh, had let me come out and observe some of the demonstrations, interview them. I open up the book, Army of None, with a scene where they're actually doing a swarm versus swarm aerial dogfight. So real planes, these little tiny styrofoam um, planes they built, very, very cheap. The most expensive thing on this is the GoPro camera. And they're flying them in the air. Now, they're not actually shooting, that part simulated, but real maneuvering between the aircraft. And they're trying to work up to a 50 on 50 aerial swarm dogfight. And the one that I saw, they've got a red swarm and a blue swarm, 10 versus 10 up in the air. And the really interesting thing about this is, when the referee gave the countdown and said go, they had a human sitting at each laptop commanding each of the two swarms. And all the humans did was push enter. And that was it. They were done. Everything else was totally autonomous, all done by these aircraft individually. And so that's one of the areas that we're seeing warfare evolve, where people are being pushed back from the edge of the battlefield, not just physically, but also cognitively, as more and more decisions are being made by these systems operating at machine speed. Now, it's not just physical systems, but also in cyberspace. This is a um, diagram showing the spread of one version of Stuxnet across the internet where Stuxnet spread across USB drives and networks in search of what um, security researchers presume was its intended target, Iranian centrifuges at Natanz, at which point it deployed two encrypted payloads, one to sabotage those uh, centrifuge operations, and another one recording normal operations and then playing them back to um, people observing them like a bank surveillance video in a bank heist movie, telling people everyone's fine here. This, what's really interesting about this technology is, unlike many systems, where if you got a hold of a, a physical object, you have to find ways to replicate it and rebuild it, these things are open source weapons. This code has already been reused by others in malware and other attacks since then. 
It's not just um, Stuxnet. We continue to see autonomy evolve in cyberspace. Since then, um, this is the winner of DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge from 2016, uh, built by a team at Carnegie Mellon, um, or out of Carnegie Mellon, rather, I should say. Um, the comp winning computer's name was called Mayhem. One of the challenges, um, I understand folks from DOD were out here last week, right, talking about uh, ethics and principles. One of the challenges the department often faces in this space is while they are simultaneously telling people, don't worry, we're going to use this stuff responsibly, they do people naming things like mayhem, uh, which probably doesn't calm anyone's fears. But in this case, what this is being used for is autonomously searching computer networks to find cyber vulnerabilities and then either defensively patching these or offensively exploiting them. Same technology, totally dual use. It was being used, in this case, in a competition among different um, computers to do this. But it's also been pitted against human hackers since then. Now, it's not better than the best human hackers in the world. But in competitions, it's ranked in the top 20. It's pretty good. And more importantly, it's much easier and cheaper to replicate this than growing a new cybersecurity specialist. It takes a lot of time. And so this kind of technology is some of the things that can be used to help secure the billions of IoT devices that are now being put out on the network that are very insecure. Um, use this in an automated way to test technology beforehand and then begin to raise its level of security. Much cheaper to do this than trying to create hundreds of thousands of new cybersecurity specialists but also as offensive applications as well. Now, I want to talk briefly about some of the legal and ethical and strategic questions surrounding this technology. Each of these is a whole chapter in the book, so I'm just going to have to like really condense things to a couple highlights. So um, let's talk about the laws of war for a second. That's one of the first things that comes up. People say, what about the laws of war? What do they say about this? Well, what's interesting is they don't say very much at all. There's nothing in the laws of war at all that comments one way or the other about autonomous weapons. Now, there are two ways to view this. One way to view this, and this is what I often hear from um, Western military legal experts, is they'll say, it's because the laws of war are about the effects on the battlefield. So the laws of war lay down a set of principles that militaries have to follow in warfare, things like the principle of distinction, that militaries can only intentionally target the enemy they cannot intentionally target civilians. Or the principle of proportionality that acknowledges that some civilian deaths and collateral damage happen in war. They are an unfortunate but, but very real and unavoidable part of warfare. But that any civilian deaths cannot be disproportionate to the military necessity of the target being attacked. And so what some of these experts will say is that if autonomous weapons could apply with these principles, comply with them better than humans, then we should use them. And maybe they're not there today, but if they can get there someday, then we have an obligation, actually, to use these. Just the same way that someday self-driving cars will be better than humans, and we'll put them on the roads, and we'll save lives. Maybe we can use the same technology to save lives in warfare. Now, the other view is that there's nothing in the laws of war about autonomous weapons because it was just obvious throughout all of human history that people were making these decisions. And people still should be making them. And so now we need to write this down, because now that's a choice. And there's a variety of different arguments about why that might be a good idea, anywhere from machines aren't good enough, to even if machines were good, um, humans might still need to be in charge for reasons of accountability or moral responsibility. I also want to talk about some of the ethical issues that come up. So the laws of war give one framework for thinking about warfare. But there are also ethical concerns that might be outside of the laws of war. Um, to illustrate this, I want to talk about an experience I had as an Army Ranger when I was um, fighting in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There was an incident early in Afghanistan where I was part of an Army Ranger sniper team that was sent out to the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Now, we were looking for Taliban fighters. We infiltrated at night under cover of darkness into terrain that was not too dissimilar from this, actually. Um, this is not a photograph of exactly where we were, but um, places like this that it was like this had very little uh, vegetation, very little cover. And when the sun came up, we were very, very exposed. And a farmer came out in the morning to relieve himself in the fields and looked up 
and saw about eight of us with their heads bobbing above sort of a small rock outcropping. And he tried to act real nonchalant. We were basically in this guy's backyard, kind of like tried to pretend he didn't see us, and then he scurried back inside. And we knew we were compromised, and we expected to see some Taliban fighters coming after. What we did not expect, because this was still pretty early in the wars, <clears throat> was what they did next, which was they sent a little girl to scout at our position. So she came along. She was about five or six. <coughs> Excuse me. She had a couple little goats in tow, um, sensibly as cover that she was herding goats. And she comes along and walked a long, slow circle around us. Now, she was not very sneaky. It was pretty obvious she was there to scout us out. We heard what we later realized was the, the chirping of a radio that she had on her, probably reporting back information about us. So we watched her, and she watched us, and eventually she left, and some fighters did come after that. Now, we, we took care of them, and the gunfight that ensued brought out the whole valley, so we had to leave. But later, we were talking about how we would deal with a similar situation. What happens if we came across someone, and we weren't sure if they were a civilian or if they were spotting for the enemy? Now, one thing that I can tell you never came up in the conversation was this idea of shooting this little girl. No one raised that. It was not a topic of discussion. What's interesting is under the laws of war, that would have been legal. Because the laws of war don't set an age for combatants. Your status as a combatant is based on whether or you are participating in hostilities. And by scouting for the enemy, she was participating in hostilities just the same way if she was an 18-year-old man doing so. So if you built a robot to perfectly comply with the laws of war, you would have shot this little girl. Now, I think that that would be wrong in this instance, if not legally, then morally. It's certainly not consistent with the values that I was raised with or those on my team. But it begs the question, how would you design a robot to know the difference between what is legal and what is right? And how would you even begin to write down those rules ahead of time if you didn't have a human there to interpret these and to, to bring that whole set of human values to those decisions? Lastly, I want to talk about um, a really important issue about international stability. So what would a world of autonomous weapons look like if countries were to move forward with this technology? Well, we might have a situation where countries are using lots of automation, operating at machine speeds, and competitive environments, where countries aren't willing to share their algorithms with others. We have one example of what this might look like, and it's stock trading. And we've seen examples of accidents that come from this environment in stock trading. Where we have an arms race in speed among algorithms, we have surprise interactions among them, like, for example, flash crashes. This is the stock market on the day of the uh, big flash crash in 2010. Now, what's interesting about this is, first of all, there's still dispute over what drove this event among different security researchers. There's clear that there was a combination of factors, volatility in the market, um, some algorithms that had some brittleness in their behavior that continued executing um, their programming even after market conditions changed dramatically. High frequency trading looks like it exacerbated this, as well as people deliberately manipulating algorithms, spoofing these algorithms and finding ways to take advantage of them. All of those are conditions that might exist in a warfare kind of environment. Now, you may have heard less about this because what regulators have done to deal with this problem is they haven't actually fixed this. What they've done is they've installed circuit breakers to take stocks offline if the price moves too quickly. So this didn't stop the event from occurring. Many flash crashes continue to occur. And in fact, a few years ago, there was an incident where over 1,000 circuit breakers were tripped across multiple markets in a single day. What they've merely done is install these circuit breakers to then mitigate the consequences of these things. But that doesn't exist in warfare. There's no referee to call time out if things begin to spiral out of control. So if countries are going to find ways to build in safeguards, they have to build them themselves, or actually working hand in hand with potential adversaries, which is very challenging. Now, countries have been coming together at the United Nations for several years now, since 2014, to discuss autonomous weapons. This is a photograph of um, me and a number of other folks from the international community, people from uh, Human Rights Watch, 
um, as well as a consortium of, of 60 uh, non-governmental organizations that have come together to argue for a ban on autonomous weapons, people from the ICRC and other international organizations, and around 100 countries that have come together to discuss this. But diplomacy is moving very, very slowly on this issue. Um, certainly is does significantly out of step with the pace of technological advancement. I want to close with a quote from General Paul Silva, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's the number two person in the US military, seen here in the background, um, next to former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, who's been, a, during his time at the Pentagon, was a major champion of robotics and autonomy. General Silva here says, I think we should all be advocates for keeping the ethical rules of war in place, lest we unleash on humanity a set of robots that we don't know how to control. I think this is really interesting because this is, again, the number two military official in the US talking about humanity, talking about ethics, expressing a sentiment that we want to keep humans in control of these decisions. But it's also interesting because how do you put this into practice? Let's say you said, OK, this is it. We're going to do this. We got it. How do you tell an engineer, right, we need to do this? And that's a challenge not just for the US but for others is to figure out as we move forward with this technology, how do we find ways to use it that might make more for more precise and more humane, but that we don't lose our humanity in the process. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming today. And we've got lots of time for an interesting discussion to follow. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you, Paul. That was terrific. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to now ask uh, Rada and Jeremy to join Paul on the stage for our conversation. And as they come out, or come up, I should say, uh, let me do, tell you a little bit about each of their backgrounds. So Dr. Rada Iyengar Plum is the head of product policy research at Facebook and an adjunct economist at the RAND Corporation. Previously, she served in senior staff positions at the White House National Security Council, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Energy, and she has her PhD in economics from Princeton. Jeremy Weinstein uh, is professor of political science, a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development uh, in Washington, DC. His research focuses on civil wars and political violence, ethnic politics and the political economy of development, and democracy, accountability, and political change. He's, he also served as deputy to the US ambassador to the UN on the, and on the NSC staff uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, but perhaps most germane to today's discussion, Jeremy helped design and co-teach a core course in the Stanford Computer Science Department to help students grapple, grapple with the ethical, social, and political implications of emerging technologies. And in other words, how do we make sure that all those folks who are graduating who create those killer apps don't create killer apps? Uh, so uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over. Uh, they'll they'll uh, talk amongst themselves uh, with us all eavesdropping in uh, for about 30 minutes, and then we'll go to your questions. And I know that the index cards have been collected, and Rada and Jeremy will curate those. And uh, yeah, great. Uh, so I thought I would start us off. Uh, and as Colin warned you, I'm an economist. So I'm just going to start with <laughs> far away from the ethical discussion and talk a little bit about some of the pragmatics of, of what Paul is saying and sort of pepper him with a couple of questions. So I think to start with and taking a step back from, frankly, whatever environment we're looking at and, and fretting about today, it's helpful to think a little bit about what is a counterfactual. And again, I warned you I was an economist, so I'm going to do this, which is what are we comparing this to? And so it's not necessarily to say that there aren't things to fret about or there aren't real concerns, but I think it's helpful to distinguish the question of what are concerns and things we're gonna have to deal with regardless of automation, regardless of technology and innovation, and, and what are the things that are unique to this environment? And parsing those things out has, has a couple of useful uh, elements to it. Just one, at its core, when we talk about autonomous weapon systems or autonomous anything, what we actually mean is human programmed machines. And I, and I want to keep using that terminology for the reason that ultimately what the decision we want to make is how much of a rules-based, explicitly consistent decision architecture are we comfortable with? And at the end of the day, when you say it like that, you're like, well, 
I kind of like the idea of consistent decision making, right? I think a rules-based system might make sense, and a lot of the constraints we want to put on this system are ultimately themselves rules-based systems, like laws or regulations, uh, circuit breakers, right? All of that are, are rules-based questions that are solving a fundamentally rules-based problem. And so in, in separating out sort of this idea of autonomy slash human programming, I think it's helpful to understand what is fundamentally different and how much is the fundamental differences driving our concerns versus things like speed or scope where we think problems that currently exist might just exist more. That doesn't make those problems not bad, doesn't make them not problems, but it makes thinking about how to deal with them potentially different than new problems that we have to deal with. So question one for Paul, and, and I'll ask three and then I'll stop, which is what is fundamentally different and, and I, and I want to kind of return and hearken back to Paul's story because my second question is really well illustrated by his uh, story about the little girl, which is we really like judgment when it protects little girls with goats. We don't necessarily like judgment when it means that we feel very uncomfortable with collateral damage in certain settings with certain types of victims who maybe look more like us or feel culturally more like us, but we're much more comfortable with collateral damage and civilian casualties in settings where we don't. In those senses, our judgment, intuitions, and sort of tolerance for different types of collateral damage might actually not be that useful. And, and, so, and so the second part is how much of the fundamental difference in these uh, rules-based human program machines versus human executed operations, do we think we want sort of this type of consistency and where is that sort of strategically valuable? And, and the last one, and, and I'll just close with this, is at the end of the day, what we really need to think about is how do we think about assessing the risks and benefits of these systems in the context of what is fundamentally different? And in particular, I think it'd be interesting to hear, Paul, from you on two kinds of assessments, which are one, this question of like, what are the benefits and risks? How do we, how do we, should we think about valuing them? How should we think about ideally measuring them in a consistent way? But two, or B, whatever, uh, how should we think about what that means on when we're comfortable launching new technologies, right? And, and, and by that I mean, at some point we're just trading off risks here. We have a benefit and cost analysis and we have some fundamentally new things that we're not going to know, we're not going to be, it are not going to be realized until launch. And so how do we decide when is it okay to put this in the battlefield and kind of see what happens and when do we think we want to hold back either for street strategic or for sort of values based ethical legal reasons. I'll stop there. Okay. I will try to remember all those, but if yeah, I forget. But I, I'll, I'll harass you. So. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think you really hit the nail on the head um, the way you frame this, that it's not, it's not really that you're, you're giving up human decision making. It's that you're embedding human decision making in the machine ahead of time. And so you're getting the benefit or the handcuffs, depending on the point of view, of consistency. Um, someone once described it to me as autonomy as a flywheel for human agency. Um, and, and so I think there are a couple aspects of this. One is... There might be some things where you just don't have good enough data, you don't have good enough sensors to make a decision to allow a machine to make those functions reliably, right? And okay, that's fine. Things like that, you can set aside and say not there yet. Brings you really to the question though of as the technology evolves, what are you gonna wanna do? When it's no longer a question of can the machine do it, but should the machine do it? And there are some things where I think the answer will be yes, when there are clearly defined parameters for what is better performance, right? If you're trying to do medical diagnoses, well, like you want the right diagnosis. What is um, the right you know, decision to take afterwards? What is the right course of treatment? They may not have a clear right answer. It might depend on discussion with you and your doctor, but you want the right diagnosis to start. Self-driving cars is another good example of this. Like getting from point A to point B without hitting anyone, that's better performance. Um, that's a place where once the machines are good enough, you're going to want to automate that. But to this other question about judgment, I think there are clearly areas where you can see the argument on either side, right? Um, let's talk about sentencing, for example. Okay? 
You might have issues of fact in criminal justice, right? Did this person kill this other person? There's a, there's a fact there. Um, but then there's a question of, once we've determined what the facts are, what's the right punishment? And that's a place where I could see strong arguments on either side, right? On the one hand, you might say, look, we won't want to be stuck into these rigid rules about what the punishment is. We want a human who could look at the whole situation and could try to understand, does this person feel guilty? Are they remorseful? Have they tried to, to make amends afterwards? What is the human cost of these actions? Um, those are things that you might want factored into those decisions. On the other hand, we also know that humans have like biases. Humans make mistakes. There are huge examples of, in the criminal justice system, ra uh, racial injustice and bias in the way our system is involved and in sentencing. And so those might be places where algorithms could help. And so I think those are like, I think those are challenging questions. It's also worth pointing out that we don't have to make a binary choice between one or the other. Right? And that's probably the best outcome in many of these situations, particularly when there isn't an element of speed, where you could take the time to pause. Could we use algorithms to correct some of those biases that people engage in, but also allow for humans to weigh in? People have looked at this in medicine of trying to combine um, doctors and machines together. There are ways to do this wrong and get the suboptimal outcomes, but there are ways to do this better. Um, if you do things like allow doctors to override the machine, but when they do so, the doctors have to explain why, what the reasoning is. Um, and so those are the, I think, and in general, I very much am a fan of this paradigm of trying to combine humans and machines together because they're, they're better at just very different things. Um, to your question about risks, you know, there are some areas where, again, we can, we can dig up good data for performance and then try to find a way to assess this. If you look at self-driving cars, Waymo said that they've clocked uh, you know, 10 million miles on roads, and then they're doing another 10 million every day on uh, synthetic data of simulated driving, right? So we'll be able to get a sense over time of the performance of these things. This is really hard in the space of warfare because thankfully we're not fighting 10 million wars every day, which is great. War is a very unusual phenomenon. Most militaries are engaged in peace on a day-to-day -day basis. What this means, though, is that unlike in areas like self-driving cars or commercial airliners, where we can test things, we can have high reliability because we can actually engage in day-to-day -day operations, in warfare, we can do lots of testing in peacetime, but we're never really going to know how systems perform until you get into wartime. And then we have accidents sometimes. There was an incident in 2003 where the Patriot Air Defense System, one of the pictures I showed there, shot down two friendly aircraft during the opening phases of the Iraq War. And there was a combination of things that came up in testing, but weren't identified and corrected, weren't educated to the operators, as well as new things that had never come up before and were novel in war. And that's always going to be a challenge, in particular because your adversary is going to try to force those um, incidents on you. So let, let me take us in a slightly different direction, which is, in some sense, to interrogate your use of the word we. Yes. Right? So, so we. In, in your response, you've been talking a lot about we can do this, we can do that. It doesn't need to be a binary choice. We can embed the rules we want. But of course, from the slides you showed us, we is not just we in the United States or just we in the United States government. And so you sort of you know, gave me some bad memories of my time in government with the picture of deliberations at the United Nations. This is a really difficult place to get agreement. And so I wanna start by asking you to describe what you think ought to be our objective in the international sphere, and then we can shift to what might actually be achievable in the international sphere. But let's, let's assume that we could write the terms of some sort of structure you know, at the international level, what actually would we want out of that structure when we think not only about uh, this kind of destabilization that we might want to avoid in the international system, but also just protecting and defending the security of the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think in the best possible outcome, it would be great to see countries agree on some set of rules for how to use these systems that avoid some of the worst possible outcomes. You're never going to entirely avoid risk of accidents or harm, but we don't want to transition to a world where either countries are deploying things that have markedly more propensity for civilian harm than people today. And of course, you know, people make mistakes. People aren't perfect. 
Um, but we don't want something that's, that's significantly worse. And we don't want something that leads to some of these stability risks that I mentioned, right? Where countries are maybe incentivized to engage in this arms race and speed. The problem is a couple things. Um, most predominantly, nobody trusts each other. And so, you know, countries have been coming together to be part of these discussions internationally, but other than like agree to come to the table to talk about this, there's no agreement at all on where this is going. You have three broad camps. You basically have um, a group predominantly being led by the human rights community, by non-governmental organizations, saying we need an international legally binding treaty that would create a preemptive ban on autonomous weapons before they could be built. We need to take these off the table. And they're looking to prior bans on landmines and cluster munitions as examples of what might be done in this space. And they're saying, look, countries cannot be trusted. You guys do a terrible job of, you guys as in nations, right, do a terrible job of complying with the laws of war anyways. So don't tell me about the laws of war. We need to just take these things off the table. And there's a lot of validity to that, to that reasoning. Um, the problem is, is that there aren't a lot of countries that agree with them. There are about 27 countries that have said they agree, but none of those are major military powers or major robotics developers. Um, and so it hasn't yet, that, that movement has not gained a lot of sort of, um, certainly there's no consensus and not enough momentum to really drive towards action internationally. You've got a handful of countries, um, prominently led by the US and Russia, that have said, look, we have this thing called the laws of war. They are just fine, thank you very much. Everything that you're concerned about is already prohibited under the laws of war, so we don't need anything new. And we'll agree to talk, but that's it. Um, usually the US is a bit more tactful than Russia about how they communicate this, but that's, that's really the position at both of those countries. Um, and then there are a handful of countries that are sort of in the middle. France and Germany have been advocating for um, something like a non-legally binding code of conduct on this technology. Um, but all of it sort of misses the boat on what are those rules? A lot of the debate is about like what is the color piece of paper that we write it on? Is it legally binding or is it not? Instead of really focusing on, you know, what do we want to do with the technology? And unfortunately, that's taken a bit of a backseat, um, partly because the politics of the issue has driven sort of you know the shape of, of an agreement first, but also in part because many people don't don't really know. Um, there's a little bit of consensus, a shred of consensus, around the idea that humans should at some level be involved in lethal decision making. That has come out of these discussions and it's been written down in, in post-meeting documents. That's, I think, a, a good starting point. Um, but there's a lot to go from there to try to figure out what does that really mean in practice. So I'm going to push a little bit further on this because obviously you were involved in the creation of DOD policy. And DOD policy at this point requires appropriate levels of human judgment right. over the yeah. use of force. Exactly. You probably typed that into the computer when the directive was being developed. Um, and so like, what I want to ask you is, if you were authoring this document, you suggested that there ought to be a set of things that potentially we rule out. What would be on your list of what gets ruled out? And, and given the world that we exist in, anytime you say, well, the US and Russia totally agree on that. You know, kind of red flags go up for me. You know, basically countries must be agreeing to something that enables them to do profoundly different things given the different objective functions of the US and Russia. So even if you have a list of things that you think we ought to agree to at the international level, why would you have any confidence in any mechanism that would be constraining on other countries with respect to those things that you want to rule out. So what's on your short list and what's the mechanism that gives us some confidence that this could be meaningful? Yeah, um, I think, it's, okay, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of questions kind of wrapped up in there. Let me talk about the mechanism first, I guess. I have very low confidence in the ability of international treaties, even legally binding instruments, to constrain countries when they don't want to be. There's, there's no enforcement mechanism for these treaties. So, the US just backed out of the INF Treaty, the Inter Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, because Russia was treating. And when another country is cheating, the only thing you actually can do to try to enforce that is to say, all right, we're out too. Um, so that's, that's a real fundamental problem. There's no enforcement mechanism for any of these kinds of things. I see these treaties as ultimately um, a coordination mechanism between countries, which is to say that if we both actually agree it's in our interest to do something, 
it's valuable to write down on paper what that is so that we're clear in what that agreement is. Um, but you can't force a country to do this if they don't want to. Maybe there could be pressure. Some countries are more or less susceptible to some international pressure. Um, but that's a real challenge. So I think any, the only way to get to any kind of agreement, whatever the rule set is, would be if countries see it is, in fact, in their interest to set some things and say, we're not going to do that for one reason or another. And one of the challenges internationally in this space is the way the conversation has been driven, it's been driven by people in the NGO community saying, you can't have these weapons because you, nation states, cannot be trusted with them. Well, that leads every country to basically say, well, we're ethical, we're humane, we comply with the laws of war. That's not, of course, obviously true in all cases. Many countries don't at all comply with the laws of war. But they all comply about as much as they want to. And so all of them, so that that sort of argument doesn't have a lot of resonance actually with states. It might resonate with populations. It might resonate with people in the media. It might resonate with sometimes uh, parliament or others to try to put pressure on the governments, but certainly not the security apparatuses of those countries. Um, and so no one's yet made a really compelling case for why it's in their interest for militaries to not do this. The same way that the US and the Soviet Union actually did agree it was in their mutual interest to put a lot of things like intermediate range nuclear forces and other types of weapons actually off the table. Um, I would come at this from the perspective actually of saying there is some limit where we do want humans involved. Um, that how do we come at that? Where do we set that limit is I think a little bit fuzzy. But I would say a good starting point is the laws of war themselves. And I would take the position that's been espoused by the US Defense Department and their law of war manual that says that um, there is an important asymmetry between humans and machines under the laws of war, which is that humans are legal agents and machines are not. So an autonomous weapon is no more a legal agent than an M16 rifle is. And that oh, it's humans who are bound by the laws of war and humans who must comply with them. And that implies, in my mind at least, and this is my interpretation of this, this DOD doesn't say this, but my interpretation is that implies therefore some degree of involvement that humans actually have to have with these decisions to ensure that their actions are legally compliant. Um, what that is, how much information do people need to have is I think open to debate. Um, and this, this idea that humans should be involved in some level circulates all of this conversation. Internationally, um, one of the terms that's caught on is uh, meaningful human control. People will say there needs to be meaningful human control over these weapons, over lethal decisions. The US government has latched onto this term appropriate human judgment, which is in the DOD directive. It's not defined. Um, it's, so there's no, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you what it means because it means exactly what it says, right? Um, there's no definition written inside the Defense Department of what that is. But it does imply that at some level, um, humans ought to be involved in these decisions. And I think going forward, that's an important question that, that all of us need to try to unpack, um, not just you know, um, military experts working in the space and technologists, but also um, legal and ethical experts to try to understand what is that human involvement and what should it look like going forward. So before we transition to some of the questions that, that, that you've passed up to the stage, let me push on one other issue uh, that is all in the spirit of interrogating the we. Uh, so one we was the United States vis-a-vis -vis other countries around the world. But now I want to think about governments vis-a-vis -vis technology companies, because ultimately a lot of the progress that you're describing, while government may play a role in spurring some of this research, a lot of the innovation is going to come from the private sector and potentially partnerships between the government and the private sector, either in the United States or in other countries. So of course you're aware of Project Maven and the debates about Project Maven with Google where you had 3,000 employees sign a letter uh, basically saying that the company shouldn't be involved in working with the Defense Department uh, and the national security agencies in the US government. Google should not be in the business of war. And in fact, even in Google's AI policy, Google has come out and said, we want to be clear that while we are not developing AI for use in weapons, we will continue to work with governments in other ways. So Google has taken this strong position of not being involved in autonomous weapons. And one might argue that some of this is a function of the reaction that's come internally at Google from workers in the tech industry who say they don't want to be a part of 
technological innovation in this space. What do you make of these protests? What do you think of the perspectives of the tech engineers who don't want to be in the business of supporting uh, the development of autonomous systems for the US government? Uh, do you see that as unpatriotic? Do you see that as entirely justified? And ultimately, how do you see us navigating this challenge where the government, at least in the United States, and other governments have strategic interests in developing technology, but then you have private sector entities that are gonna to have to make their own decisions that reflect their own values as companies, but also their need to maintain top talent. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, for starters, I think it's great that we're seeing uh, AI scientists and engineers be concerned about how this technology is being used. I think that's a really important conversation. I'm glad to see that people are, are engaged in that, and I think we need more of that overall. Um, and I think we need an open and multidisciplinary dialogue about the use of some of these technologies in a variety of settings, not just military applications, but also um, domestic surveillance, things that we're seeing AI technology being used for overseas, for repression. Certainly China is doing some horrific things using facial recognition technology, using algorithms to track people in Xinjiang and elsewhere. Um, and I'm, that I'm deeply concerned about. Um, I do think that you know, there's, a couple, there's a couple facets of this, this kind of particular debate between kind of Silicon Valley and the Pentagon. Part of it is that DOD doesn't do a very good job of explaining what they're doing. Um, Maven was a good example of this. A lot of, I am, I'm told from people who are close to this issue that most of the signatures came before people even knew what Maven was. And then afterwards, once there were some more details about it, there was less of that. I think in this particular instance, all of the angst and frustration from employees at Google was probably exacerbated by the fact that it was a secret project, which I don't think was helpful in this case. Whenever you do something that's in secret, people assume it's secret because you're doing something wrong. right? And that if Google and the Pentagon had come out clearly and said, here's what we're doing, here's why we think it's important, here's why we think it will um, save lives in warfare, it'll save service member lives, it'll save civilian lives, it'll make what we're doing, um, make us have better situational awareness, I think that would be a good thing. Part of it has to do with Maven is like not, even though what it was doing was like super innocuous, had nothing to do with weapons, they're learning more about the environment, it's doing so on a drone. And any time you talk about drones, people get, people get upset, right? Because people start thinking about drone strikes, and people are upset about drone strike policy, and it gets wrapped up in these broader kinds of things that are challenging. Um, but you know, there's, there's like sort of a couple different debates that are going on here. One is about what the military does with this technology. I think that's a really important conversation. Um, I have confidence that in these instances, what the DOD is doing is right. But I think we need to talk about this. And I could envision things that are not a good idea. right? And I think it's good that people from the technology community are involved. But a whole other facet of this technology is that there are lots of people at these companies who are not Americans, who don't see themselves. I mean, it's not just that they don't see themselves as having an allegiance to the United States. Some of them are not from the United States because these are international companies. And they have researchers from abroad that are working here or in other countries. And so a lot of these, these are US-based countries uh, companies, but they see themselves as global companies that are multinational. Um, you know, in some instances, we've seen um, leadership from Amazon and Microsoft come out and say, look, we are headquartered here in the US. Um, we grew up here in the US. We are going to work closely um, with the US government on these technologies. Um, but I realize that not all companies are going to see themselves that way. I do think there's a really important discussion that we, that we need to have, we in the sense of, um, I'm going to say broadly, people who care about human rights, about how this technology is used, not just in the US, but elsewhere. And um, now AI technology is becoming very, very real. It's being used in military and other applications. And um, I do think we need to have a conversation about like who are these companies going to work with. Uh, Microsoft, their leadership has said that there was at least one instance where a foreign government, they wouldn't say which one, um, wanted to use their facial recognition technology. And they said, no, they weren't comfortable with that com uh, country's track record of human rights. But you know, I think it's, it's good that we have the right mechanisms in democratic countries to handle these kinds of issues in military and other space. Um, and we have the right institutional mechanisms to deal with this. They don't exist elsewhere. Um, but I do think that we have a broader conversation about where are individuals, where are universities, and uh, where are companies, who are they going to work with as they use this technology?
So let me shift us into questions from yes. the audience uh, so we can read some of them. So uh, let me start with this one, which is to you, Paul. Do we really think the threat we face is sufficiently great to warrant a major growth in autonomous weaponry? So I would say no, actually, <laughs> right? So um, I don't distinguish between robotics and a, and a lethal autonomous weapons. I think there's, there's lots of huge advantages to military robotics. Um, where you could still keep people in the loop, people making these kinds of decisions. The question is, you know, how much do we really need to go to like fully autonomous weapons? It's not obvious to me that you need to. In fact, some of the most compelling reasons to do so are fears that the other person's going to do so. Well, that's a bit of a problem. And that's, in fact, what US Defense Department leaders have said. They said their intention is to keep humans in the loop for these decisions. They're, the only reason they might change that, they've said, is if others don't and they feel that they have, they're compelled to respond. Um, the challenge there is how do you get to a position of trust? Because if other countries are also believing, well, you're developing these weapons in secret, and there's no good way to prove that you're not, that could lead to a world where countries are building autonomous weapons simply because of the fear that others are already doing so. So let me uh, return to this theme that, that you raised with one of these questions from the audience about the laws of war. And uh, you know, we read a lot in the paper about the decline of the liberal international order. So I'd say that this question comes from a, a place of real concern with respect to the international mechanisms and norms uh, that govern our interaction among countries at this moment in time. And, and it's basically framed as following. Are there really any laws of war left that you need to think about when it comes to the design of autonomous weapons? That is. I assume this means, in part, you look at the behavior of Bashar al-Assad uh, in Syria. You know, there's no sense in any way that proportionality or distinction are, are sort of laws that are meaningful in that context by the Syrian regime. You think about sort of the authorized use of force at the international level that comes from the UN Security Council. Clearly, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, was not authorized by the international community. So in what sense are there even a set of laws of war that do need to be programmed into autonomous weapons? Or are we reaching a point where these norms and rules are no longer binding in ways like the INF that the US and other countries should stick with? Well, I mean, so the, the term laws of war is kind of a funny term because they're not laws the way that domestic laws are. In the sense of there's no one to enforce them. There's no police, there's no judicial system, there's no attorneys to try people. Um, there, there are a set of rules and principles for appropriate conduct in war. And they exist for a couple reasons. Um, one, so that when countries fight each other, they can agree that there's a set of sort of rules for how we're gonna behave to constrain the worst excesses of war. Um, to say, hey look, let's all agree that once someone surrenders, we don't shoot them anymore. And if I agree to do that, and you agree to do that, then this will all be a lot better off for both of us. Um, and, and that's, you know, most of these are self-reinforcing in the sense of if people violate them, the natural consequence is the other side then reciprocates. And so reciprocity is the real sort of driver here. There are always gonna be some actors that don't comply with the laws of war. There are always gonna be terrorists and rogue regimes. That doesn't mean that they're not important for countries who do care about human rights to comply with. They matter because they make war um, more humane and less terrible for everyone involved. They also, I think, matter because how we conduct ourselves as a nation matters. Um, as somebody you know, who fought in uniform, like my actions mattered to me. Um, and complying with, with you know, American values, with things that I could live with, things that I could look at myself in the mirror afterwards mattered to me. And so I think those are important, those are another really important reason why we have these rules is so that they can keep in check some of these worst excesses in war for ourselves. Um, so let me return to the example you gave there on if, if I surrender to you, we don't kill you and, and vice versa. Because I think it's a useful uh, example and one that's echoed in this question, um, but also in thinking about what the pragmatics of having autonomous weapons on the battlefield are. So the question here is, what, happen if what happens if troops try to surrender to an autonomous weapon? Must there not be some provision to make that possible? What if they surrender then destroy the weapon? Right? So I think there's, to some extent, our intuitions and rules are based on 
this kind of like, look, I don't want you to kill my guys when they surrender, so I'm not going to kill your guys when we do this. Though, though that starts to break down when you have this sort of asymmetry of humans on one side and, and weapons on the other side. So in a pragmatic sense, how do we think about either updating or programming or addressing those types of realities in the context of autonomous weapons on the battlefield? Yeah, so that's a really good question because it's easy to say in broad strokes, if autonomous weapons could comply with the laws of war, then we could use them. That's a really big if. And there's a lot of things like captured under that if. And this is one of those really tough problems. So how would we figure out how to do this? To make an autonomous weapon identify automatically if someone was surrendering. So you might say you write down a set of rules, right? If someone waves a white flag, then they've surrendered. If they stick their hands up, then they've surrendered. Now that sounds OK, but it has a couple problems. One might be that there's situations people are surrendering, and they're not doing those things, and the machine might miss it, and it kills them. Right? So that's one set of problems. Um, maybe the person's like got their arm shot, and they can't lift their arm up, and they've only got one arm up. Maybe they don't have a white flag, or the white flag is dirty and it's not recognized. Right? A whole set of problems there. The other interesting challenge here is all of these rules and conditions could be manipulated by some nefarious actor. Now, it is illegal under the laws of war to engage in um, what the laws of war refer to as a ruse. So you can, you can sneak around, you can hide, that's fine. But you're, it's illegal to, say, wave a white flag of false surrender, and then when people come, you attack them. Doesn't mean people wouldn't do it, particularly if you had an autonomous weapon that was tricked by these things. Um, and so that's a situation where like, humans would probably do a much better job of being like, ah, oh, they're not serious. I could tell they're not serious, like they're ready to shoot us. Um, this is fake. Or they might also be able to say, look, these guys are surrendering even though I don't meet the certain criteria. Um, this is one of many reasons why a lot of autonomous weapons that would target people, what the military calls anti-personnel autonomous weapons, are just much more problematic than things that would target machines. Um, Can I just push on you yeah. on that just a little tiny bit, which is to say, in some senses, we have these types of, I mean, to put it bluntly, type one and type two errors and malicious and well-intentioned actors, right? Like that's the two by two problem you've drawn where you have false positives, sometimes by people who just have a dirty white fat flag, right. sometimes by people manipulating the system and like, what do you do about them? There are answerable questions that fundamentally there's gonna have to be a values decision. You're gonna have to accept risk on one side or the other. What I'm wondering is why is that different than now? Right now, there's certainly differential. I suspect I might be better at guessing whether you really mean surrender if your behavior is more culturally similar to mine or your age is more similar to mine or you're a traditional military versus a non-state actor, right? Like I might be able to comply in much more consistent ways in that setting than another, yet we don't feel like that consistency is critical to the notion of these rules operating in the way we do on weapons. We're not like, oh, look, we can't deploy these soldiers. They might be biased, right? Like, that's not, that's not our military decision making. So why here? Like, what is fundamentally different that we feel like when machines are making that decision? I think what's challenging in this particular instance is that these types of decisions about what, whether a human is surrendering depend upon a theory of mind being able to look at this person and then try to estimate what are their motivations. So, you know, a person is approaching at a checkpoint. This is a situation military service members encounter. They're at a checkpoint, someone's approaching. Is this person hostile or not? And it's not just about, you know, some checklist of, you know, do I tell them to stop and they keep walking? If you follow the checklist, that might help you defend your actions to a commander. But ultimately, there's a lot of things that bake into their decisions of people looking at this, thinking about the context, what's going on, and trying to decide, like, is this person trying to approach me with a suicide vest on? Are they going to blow me up? Or are they just confused and they didn't realize that I'm telling them they need to stop? And machines are terrible at those kinds of things. Machines are good at recognizing faces. They can recognize posture. They can recognize objects. The machines today, at least, are not able to put this together and sort of make a prediction about how are people thinking? What is their intention? They don't have the context to do that. And so that seems like a place where maybe someday machines could do that better. But that's at least a, a real long ways off from where we are today. So I think you're being super generous to what machines are good at, even outlining what they're not good at. 
right, in the sense that we know that even recognizing faces, machines have extraordinary limits, especially as a function of what kind of input data is available mm -hmm. to the machine learning algorithms. And so it motivates, you know, this follow-up question, which is, um, you know, you, I think, have done a real service for the foreign policy community in helping to educate people about these new technological frontiers. You know, your recent piece in Foreign Affairs is introducing people to sort of what autonomy actually means and how it functions, and that has turned you, in effect, into an advocate for what you call safety first, right? You believe that the U.S. government, as it approaches the use of new autonomous weaponry on the battlefield, has got to err on the side of caution with respect to deployment because the harm, potential harms that could be done by technologies that are under-tested and underdeveloped are significant. And in a world in which this represents some step beyond human judgment and the kind of legal understandings that we have associated with human judgment, you want to go safety first. Um, but I think you're also cognizant, uh, cognizant of the AI arms race and the fact that others may not play by the safety first rules. And so I think it'd be helpful for you to play out a little bit for us that strategic dynamic. So you want this position of caution, right? Safety first, dedicated testing. Others may not be so willing to move slowly with respect to the advance of these systems. Does that represent some fundamental risk for the United States if we are too cautious with respect to testing and deploying these technologies when other countries are building swarming aircrafts and other countries are deploying a set of autonomous submarines uh, you know, that, that basically carry payloads with them that can destroy our fleets? Yeah, I mean, I think there's risk on both sides. And the question is, how do you effectively try to balance that risk? And how do you not get in a situation where you create perverse incentives for your adversary or yourself to short circuit and shortcut test and evaluation behind these systems. Um, because, you know, one of the challenges is there are huge vulnerabilities in a lot of these AI technologies today. Um, when you put them out in the real world, they do weird things, they do surprising things. It's even more so when you start to bake in machine learning, you could have issues of biased data, um, you could have issues of, you know, surprising learned behavior. All of these are really going to be exacerbated in these kinds of competitive environments. Of course, you know, for, you know for a fact you're going to have biased data because your adversary is not going to let you have the actual data of their weapon systems. And one of the things that, that militaries do is they talk about reserve, the whole reserve modes for the operation of their systems. So if you build a radar, militaries have their radars turned on along their coastlines, the borders of their territory, on a day-to-day -day basis so they can see who's coming in. And if someone starts to encroach, they turn the radar on them, and then they might scramble some fighters to intercept. That's also a great way, then, for countries to gather information about others' radar. What frequency are they operating at? What power? How does it work? And then they use that, and they try to find ways to then defeat that radar. So you bake in things like reserve modes, war, ones that you never actually show in peacetime and you only use in wartime. So you know that you're going to have problems where something's going to be different and novel in warfare. Um, the way that we deal with this now is we tell humans things like no plan survives con first contact with the enemy. We tell people, you know, you have training, but then you need to be flexible and adaptable once you get out there on the battlefield. But machines can't do that. And so um, one of the things why I wrote this article in Foreign Affairs was to really bring to the conversation in the national security community all of these vulnerabilities that people are actually not super aware of in Washington. AI engineers understand them. Um, but in Washington, it's largely right now a one-sided conversation. It's people focusing on one element of that risk equation, saying we can't fall behind others. That's true. That's fair. I, if you really were just concerned about accidents, you'd say we're not going to use this technology. And I don't think that's the answer. Um, I do think the US needs to be using AI to defend itself. But we want to be thoughtful about how we do so. So if you can think about computers as an analogy, if you were to go back a couple decades, um, would we want to use computers to make the military more capable, more advanced? I would say yes. But we should also think about cyber vulnerabilities. And we, that needs to be a factor in how we use them. So similarly with AI, we need to think about vulnerabilities in these technologies, whereas they might fail or be exploited by others. And that should change how we use them. So I'm going to ask one last question from the audience and invite Colin to come up to, to sort of conclude our discussion. 
Um, and I think it's a very appropriate question to end with, given sort of where you are uh, and the message that you're bringing, which is, what are, you know, in the last minute, what are, what are two or three questions that you think the Stanford academic community is prepared and capable of helping to answer around these issues that are raising? And relatedly, how do we energize a set of undergraduates and graduate students to think that issues in this space are what they should be focusing their attention on rather than the naturally more attractive things that are happening in Silicon Valley, which are dancing around some of these really sensitive issues related to national security? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in, in not just the military space, but a whole variety of applications of AI, we're going to be confronted with this challenge of how do we use this technology? Where are places where um, we want to use it to replace or augment human decision making? And then where are the places where we want to preserve space for human judgment? And how do we do that? And all of those are interdisciplinary conversations when we need not just technologists, but also lawyers and ethicists and political scientists and sociologists and others in the room as part of that. Um, and so I think, you know, on autonomous weapons, I've been very fortunate to be a part of a very inter interdisciplinary group of people working on these issues. Um, and we need that in a lot of other spaces as well. And folks at Stanford and elsewhere can contribute a great deal to that conversation. Great. Colin. Well, great. Um, well, first of all, join me in thanking uh, Paul, Rada, and Jeremy for an enlightening, interesting, and at times terrifying uh, conversation. I think that uh, those of you in the Stanford community know that one of the top priorities right now for the university is to make sure that all those brilliant minds uh, that we're churning out, many of which going to work for uh, companies in the Valley, um, are also equipped with the analytical uh, uh, and ethical tools uh, to consider the full implications of the technologies that they are helping to develop that are going to shape the rest of our lives. So uh, we're committed at CSAC to engaging in conversations just like this, and you can expect more of this. Uh, we have a, a great partnership with the new human-centered AI initiative here at Stanford, which is very much focused on making sure that social, economic, and ethical questions related to AI development are front and center as, as these uh, tools uh, evolve uh, to make sure that we're, we're doing more good than evil. Uh, and I think that's a, probably a good mission statement uh, for all of us. It's certainly what we hope to do <clears throat> at CSAC. It is a CSAC tradition that every time we have a Drell lecture, we have a poster. Uh, and we frame that poster and we give it to our speakers. So I would like to present Paul with your poster. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. And thanks, thanks to all of you for joining us tonight and have a wonderful evening.